Dear Heavenly Father, we pray this afternoon in our meeting that with thanksgiving that though you are high and lifted up, though you are the king of the universe, you will dwell with your children and you will teach us. Thank you for your greatness and your humility. Thank you for your power and your lowliness. We're thankful that you promise that I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. So we thank you this afternoon for the promise that you'll be here and you'll guide us and give us wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible verse that I want to look at just briefly is Revelation chapter 17 and verse 2. Revelation 17 and verse 2. It says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Now, verse 1 helps to fill in the context. The kings of the earth have committed fornication with this great whore known as Babylon the Great, of Revelation 17 and verse 5. So that would indicate to us that the kings of the earth, or we would call them political powers or political leaders, have joined together with this great apostate church. Now Babylon the Great all the reformers understood, Martin Luther, John Knox, John Calvin, Zwingli from Switzerland, Wesley from England, um, we could go on and on, John Huss, Jerome from Czechoslovakia, all of them understood who the great whore of Revelation 17 was. They all understood that that was the Roman Catholic Church system. So Revelation 17.2 tells us then that the kings or the leaders of the earth and their nations have joined together with the Roman Catholic Church. Now if we were to go back 500 years to the 16th century, and we were looking at England in the time of Henry VIII and in the time of one of his daughters, Queen Elizabeth, who reigned from 1558 to 1603. Revelation 17.2 would be an utterly shocking passage of Scripture. Because at that time in England's history, England was separating themselves, they were divorcing themselves from the papal power. But Revelation 17.2 states that there would come a time in the history of our world when England would be reunited with the papacy. Take another nation, take Germany in the 16th century. And Martin Luther through the Protestant Reformation, created the greatest chasm that a man could do by the power of God between Germany and Rome, between Protestant principles and Catholic principles. But you read Revelation 17 too and you say, from the 16th century down to the 21st century, the last 500 years, Something terrible has happened in order for John the Revelator to say that at some point towards the end of verse history, 
the kings of the earth would be united with Rome. And that would include Germany. So you have England, you have Germany, you have Switzerland, who under Zwingli and Calvin in the 16th century broke away from Catholic principles. And we could go on and on to many different countries. You could come then to the United States. And America was founded on Protestant principles in the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, where a man has the right to worship God according to the dictates of their own conscience. But Revelation 17, 2 says there would come a time, even in the history of America, when this nation would be under the control of the papacy. Because Revelation 17, 2 does not say, with whom some of the kings of the earth have committed fornication. doesn't say that, does it? It says, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication. It doesn't leave any out. What's that? And the, inhabitants of the earth. and the inhabitants of the earth. That's right, Errol. So, some, something drastic happened from the 16th century in the Protestant Reformation down to right now. Something drastic and terrible has happened that has reunited these Protestant nations with Rome. Now, in Great Controversy, pages 234 and 235, Ellen White makes it very, very clear that there was an engine that was started in the 16th century called Jesuitism that was established with one purpose. And that purpose was to undo all that Protestantism had done and to reestablish papal supremacy in the world. So, folk, for that to happen in governments and for that to have happened in churches, which it has, all churches of today have been infiltrated by the Jesuit order and taken over by the Jesuit order. For that to have happened from the 16th century down to right now, we can say one thing. The Jesuit order of the Catholic Church has been very, very successful in their drive to destroy Protestantism and to reestablish the papacy in our world. And Revelation 17, 2 tells us that. Now I want to challenge each one of you in this room today because I've taken the challenge on myself as well. I challenge each one of you to take some country, any country in the world, and study its history. And see if you can't find the outworkings of the great controversy in that country. A war between Protestant principles and Catholic principles. Because that war has raged in every nation around this world. And Revelation 17, 2 says that the papacy has won. I want to take a look this afternoon at a southern neighbor of the United States of America. A nation that from the very beginning of my childhood till many, many years, uh, even a few years ago, I have looked upon that country and thought, I've asked myself, how could America be so rich? And how could a southern neighbor of ours, right on America's border, how could they be? so terribly poor. Why is it today 
that the people of Mexico are coming across the borders from their homeland to the United States of America. Why? What has happened in Mexico that has made them so very, very poor and America so rich? And why are they trying to come into America today? And I want to take a look with you this afternoon for a little while. And I want you to understand something that none of these behind the door tapes, thanks Paul, none of these behind the door tapes are, are an all in all. Because in these tapes, we scratch the surface. That's what we do, we scratch the surface. So I would encourage all of you to get out some good history books. Um, I went to my local library and I found this book and I'm going to be quoting a lot from it today. It's called Fire and Blood, A History of Mexico. Secular library pulled it right off the shelf and folk, this book from a secular author tells of the great controversy struggle that's gone on in Mexico. This book. I read another book and uh, it was called The Horizons Concise History of Mexico by Fehrenbach. Same thing, it's all there, it's all there. Mexican history, back in about the 10th or 11th century, about a thousand years ago, there was a man who the Mexican people called Quetzalcoatl. And this man, and I probably am butchering his name, but this man, along with others, landed on the east coast of Mexico out by the area of the Yucatan Peninsula. This man was light-skinned, blue-eyed, and light hair. Obviously, he was a Northern European. They were exploring. They came into the area of the Caribbean, and they ended up on the country of what we know of today as Mexico. This fair-skinned god as the Mexican people called this man, helped the Mexicans with their agriculture. He explained to them about the calendar, about this rising of the sun, about how to figure days and weeks and months and years. And he also helped the Mexican people with worship of God, or at least the God of this European. After a while, the local priests of Mexico at that time became very angry at Quetzalcoatl's influence with the Mexican people. And so the priests drove this man, this fair-skinned god, away from Mexico. But as Quetzalcoatl left, he promised that one day he would return and take over the land of Mexico for good. From the 10th and 11th century down to the 16th century, from that time down to the 16th century of the 1500s, the Mexican people worshipped a sun god called Hutzilopochtl. That was the name of the Aztec sun god. The Mexicans were sun worshippers for centuries. Now from the Tower of Babel, we need to understand that at the Tower of Babel, the people had rejected the Creator. And so what is the most powerful element in the universe that people would replace instead of worshipping the Creator God? The sun. That's right. And so the Babel builders at the Tower of Babel were sun worshipers. And from the Tower of Babel, many of Noah's descendants went down, Ham's descendants, 
or excuse me, Mizraim's descendants went in to Egypt. Shem's went into the northeast and Ham into the west and into the northwest. Well, some of the Babel builders after a time made their way across the ocean and ended up in the western hemisphere. Now, from the Tower of Babel, we know that most of those people were sun worshippers because Stonehenge was built in England and the Druids or the people that built Stonehenge, it was in order to worship the sun god. We know that people in Rome and in other places around Europe, uh, the Mediterranean Sea, they were also sun worshippers. The Pantheon was built in honor of the sun and in order for the, the people to worship the sun. So the Mexican people just adopted what all the other Babel builders had adopted as well, and that was sun worship and how they did worship the sun in Mexico. I read repeatedly in their stories, this is what they did. When the sun would rise up in the morning, the Mexican people would rejoice because it was showing great power as it rose up into the sky. And so the Mexican people looked on the rising of the sun and said, oh great, the sun has great power. But as the sun then started to fall in the western sky and disappear, the Mexican people became very frightened. And their priest said, the sun has become very, very weak. That is why it is sinking in the sky. And so what did they do? They instituted a service where the only way that the Mexican people and the priests could be sure that the sun would rise the next day is if they would feed the sun human hearts. And as they would feed the sun on this altar in Tenochtitlan, which is now Mexico City, on their main altar there in the heart of Mexico City, they would say the sun is going to get strong. It's going to get stronger because we're feeding them, we're feeding the sun human hearts. Now let me tell you, where did they get human hearts? They had to feed they had to sacrifice people. Many, many people, not on a weekly or a monthly or a year. This was every single day. Now, from the accounts I read, what they would do, and I'm not going to go, well, I'm not even going to say it. Obviously, there were human sacrifices. They had to tear open the sternum, pull out the heart, and actually offer the heart right there on the altar. In order for the people of Mexico, the, uh, the Aztecs of Tenochtitlan, what they would do is they would go around and conquer the various tribes of Mexico. And part of the payment of these tribes to the Aztecs was to give them people. And they would then take those people and they would be used as human sacrifices to feed their sun god. You can imagine after that went on for a very, very short amount of time how the other tribes of Mexico began to feel about the Aztecs. They hated them. Suffice to say, it was an extremely sickening, grotesque, and terrible form of worship. But that's what the priests of Mexico led the Mexican people in for centuries. From an internet article, it's from www.cybertraveler.org slash Mexican history. This is what uh, it said in there from this um, website. 
It says, I was the Aztec sun, do- sun god and I had a voracious appetite. The Aztecs worshipped me above all the other gods. They built their largest pyramid in the center of Tenochtitlan in my honor. And there atop the temple, they sacrificed hundreds of people a day in service to me. Like all the ancient uh, Mesoamerican, the Mexican peoples, the Aztecs were obsessed with time. They watched me rise in the morning with great relief and set in the evening with grave concern. Seeing how weak I was at day's end led their priests to believe that I was anemic. If I didn't rise again in the morning, time would stop and the world would end. Thus they fed me a constant diet of human hearts. And then it says, the Aztecs built a warrior society that was organized for conquest, which proved more human tribute for me and coincidentally more treasure for them. That's what I was going to say. When the Aztecs would go out and fight these tribes throughout Mexico, the greatest honor they could bring to the Aztec people was to bring back as many captives as possible. Not dead, but captive living people because they wanted to offer them on the altar to their sun god. It says, The captives were well fed before they came to me. At last they were walked up the steps of my pyramid, where they were greeted by priests bearing well-sharpened obsidian knives. Four priests would hold down a captive. The fifth would cut open his chest, remove the beating heart, and offer it to me. It never occurred to them to just buy me an alarm clock. Okay, the guy's just joking there. Folk, this went on for centuries. And you can imagine the superstition and the fear of the people of Tenochtitlan or of the Aztecs. They had that to contend with. They were in absolute dreaded fear of the priests. And they also had that legend about that fair-skinned god who would someday return, Quetzalcoatl, who would come from somewhere over in the east and would come back and reclaim power and take over the Aztec Empire for good. Well, in 1519, the leader of the Aztecs at that time, probably most of us remember learning about him in school, his name was Montezuma. He was the leader of the Aztecs. His city was Tenochtitlan, which is today Mexico City. It was in 1519 that the Spanish arrived and the leader or the conquistador of the Spaniards was a man by the name of Hernando Cortez. Cortez had been in Cuba from 1504 to 1519, but he had learned about a golden city and a country of great gold to the west. And so Cortez set off with uh, not too many men and about 15 ships and headed towards what we know of today as Mexico. When Cortez arrived with his men, with horses, with muskets that the tribes of Mexico had never seen, they were convinced that Hernando Cortez was the fair-skinned god that had come to reclaim his control of Mexico. And so everywhere Cortez went, he started in the Yucatan, he went to Veracruz, and then he started making his way to the capital of Tenochtitlan. Before Cortez started on his trip inland, he had all of his ships burned because he was not going to be turning around. Now, Hernando Cortez brought with him muskets, he brought horses, but Hernando Cortez brought something else with him to the land of Mexico. And what he brought to the land of Mexico and what all Spanish and Portuguese explorers brought with them was something that would change and would control and form the history of Mexico 
from the 16th century all the way down to today. Hernando Cortez brought with him Roman Catholicism. Hernando Cortez was a devout Roman Catholic. <laughs> if you want to call it that. He believed in the church. And in this book, Fire and Blood, A History of Mexico, by a secular author, he says on page 119 and 120, he says this, Cortez struck down all the native idols he could find and ordered the company to erect a great cross and an icon to the Virgin Mary in the village center. He commanded the chaplain, there were priests, official and otherwise, with every Spanish party, to convert the village population and then say Mass. Padre Bartolome de Olmedo held Mass and also claimed a general conversion. Page 120 says, Cortes was immensely more enlightened and religious than the normal conquistador. He was honest in his desire to create a new Christian kingdom in the Indies. But what he accomplished, and there's no doubt that he knew this, by his various acts of conversion and piety was not to save the Indians, but to enlist the God of the Spaniards in his cause, at least in Spanish minds. Now did you notice what this author said? As a secular author, he said... He was honest in his desire to create a new Christian kingdom in the Indies. Now, what does that author mean when he says to create a new Christian kingdom? Is it a kingdom that's going to follow the teachings of Scripture? Is it a kingdom that's going to follow the principles of the Bible as Martin Luther was teaching? No. No. It means he was going to set up a Roman Catholic hierarchy in Mexico. There was nothing Christian about it, but in secular writings today, on U.S. US uh, News and World Report, Time Magazine, news, all the media today will tell you that the Christian Church of the Dark Ages was Rome. And you'll even see that in Seventh-day Adventist periodicals. Um, Mervyn Maxwell's tremendous books, God Cares, Volume 1 and 2. Tremendous material. But how he, as a Seventh-day Adventist historian, could call the Catholic Church of the Dark Ages Christian is beyond me. George Vandeman has done it in his book, The Rise and Fall of the Antichrist. Insanity. Hernando Cortez was there to make Mexico Catholic. Now Montezuma in the capital had sent runners out to the coast to see this fair-skinned god. Quetzalcoatl. And Montezuma believed that Hernando Cortez was the red-skinned, blue-eyed blue -eyed God who was coming back after a thousand years to retake over Mexico. Montezuma sent Cortez many presents, hoping that Cortez would accept the presents and leave. But he didn't. Cortez kept coming towards the city of Tenochtitlan. I want to read to you what Cortez saw when he arrived at Tenochtitlan. And once again, this is modern day Mexico City, but it's changed an awful lot in 500, 400 years. This is taken from John Tarleton's brief, and he calls it Irreverent History of Mexico, page 6. It's also on the internet website, www.cybertraveler.org slash Mexican history. It says this, 
And this is Cortez. We marched from what is now Veracruz to Mexico City and arrived on the outskirts of Tenochtitlan, November of 1519. What I saw when we crossed over the mountain pass and gazed down upon the valley below was the most breathtaking sight I had ever seen. A great city with more people than any European city of that age. It was built on a series of man-made islands in the middle of a crystal clear lake. They grew their food in the water using elaborate hydroponic gardens. The air above the city was clear and freshly scented by pine trees. The great city shimmered in the sunlight as if it were made of pure gold. And for Hernando Cortez, when he saw that, what do you think he had in mind? He wanted to completely ravage Tenochtitlan of all their gold. He wanted to take it over for himself and for Rome. Cortez, as the god who had come from Europe, Montezuma almost worshipped Cortez as he came into Mexico City. And Cortez and his men basically did whatever they wanted in Tenochtitlan. They gathered gold, they created disturbances, they caused troubles. Finally, there's conflicting reports, but Cortez had Montezuma arrested and confined in his own palace. And after a riot and some trouble in Mexico City, Montezuma was killed. The city was ravaged by fighting and, and bloodshed. Cortez, many of his men tried to escape out of Mexico City because they were horribly outnumbered. And the people realized that they weren't gods at all. They were greedy, whoremongering men. And so they had a terrible battle. Many of Cortez's men died as they tried to swim across to the mainland and they were weighed down with so much riches and gold, they drowned in the water. And so there was a terrible bloodshed in this beautiful city of Tenochtitlan. Well, Cortez escaped two years later in 1521. Hernando Cortez with more men from other surrounding tribes who hated the Aztecs came back to Mexico City and defeated them and by so doing took over Mexico. To whom did Hernando Cortez give credit for the victory? From John Tarleton's brief irreverent history of Mexico, page 7, Cortez, though outnumbered, we triumphed with the aid of superior technology and the Virgin Mary, whose standard we followed into battle. Now does that not sound like another man about 12 centuries before, by the name of Constantine, who in the name of seeing a cross in the sky, went forward to battle and took over the world in the 4th century for the Catholic Church? August 13, 1521, Tenochtitlan fell to Hernando Cortez's army. The great city and its fabulous empire became the Spanish. We gave thanks and claimed it in the name of the King of Spain and Christendom, or in other words, the Roman Catholic Church.
This is from another internet article, www.mexican slash embassy dot dk slash history. Page three, it's a article entitled Mexican History and Culture. It says, while Hernan or Hernando Cortez consummated the conquest, the Franciscan and Dominican monks brought Christianity and European civilization and culture to the country. In 1523, Friar Pedro de Gante founded the first school for the indigenous population, the school of San Jose, where languages and arts were taught. The construction of the first cathedral of the American continent began in Mexico City in 1530. Now I ask you, in the first school, and let's understand the historical time frame, 1521, when Montezuma and Tenochtitlan fell to Hernando Cortes, what was going on in Europe? 1521, now think for a moment. Reformation, it was in 1521 that Martin Luther said, here I stand, I can do no other. There was a revolution going on in Europe between Protestantism and Catholicism. So when the Franciscan and Dominican monks brought Christianity and started a school for the Mexican people, what were they teaching the people of Mexico? They were teaching them Roman Catholicism. And what were they teaching them about Protestantism? They were teaching the people of Mexico to despise and hate Protestantism. There was a religious war that was being that was erupting on the continent of Europe at this very time that the Franciscan and Dominican monks were bringing Catholicism to Mexico. Schools, as you notice, that they were started right after the conquest. So within 10 years, there were Catholic, a Catholic school and a Catholic church already being raised up. And 10 years, 10 years after Cortez had conquered Mexico, the Aztecs, and they were the most powerful tribe, guess who appeared to a young Mexican young man one afternoon? The Virgin of Guadalupe. That's right. And so, folk, all the way back, almost 500 years ago, the cult or the demon Mary, the demon impersonating Mary, had already infiltrated into the hearts and minds of the people of Mexico. Five, almost 500 years ago, spiritualism and all its attending horrors were being hoisted on the people of Mexico. In John Tarleton's brief, Irreverent History of Mexico, page 10, this is the account. It says, and he's, these are little... Uh, little blurbs where he has the person speaking and then you've got to guess who it is. Well, this is the Virgin of Guadalupe and it says this, I first appeared in Mexico in December of 1531 to the humble Indian peasant Juan Diego. The bishop of Mexico City didn't believe Juan Diego's story so the next time I appeared before Juan Diego, I sent him along with a bundle of yellow roses, which never grow during that time of year. When Juan Diego unrolled the roses in front of the bishop, he discovered that my image had been emblazoned on his white shawl, and it was a miracle. The bishop was convinced at last. He promptly followed my command to build a shrine at Tepeyac where I had appeared to Juan Diego. 
This was formerly a holy site for Tenochtitlan, the Aztec goddess of childbirth. Nowadays, my image can be found not only in every church, but in bus stations, marketplaces, restaurants, as well as in millions of homes. When someone falls ill or has a dying relative or desperately needs to win the lottery, they pray to me first and remember to leave a modest donation at any one of my thousands of shrines. Five hundred years ago, folks, the Catholic Church, the devil, the devil was dead on serious to destroy the southern neighbors of the United States, which was not even, not even discovered at that time. Well, yeah, I guess Amerigo Vespucci did it around 1507. But as for colonizing, we're still many, many decades into the future. But already in 1531, the demon of the Virgin Mary appears and now shrines are everywhere in Mexico. Page 182 of Fire and Blood and the author of that book by the way is T.R. Fehrenbach. Okay, Fehrenbach wrote that one. Fire and Blood History of Mexico. Page 182, the millions of villagers scattered throughout the civilized highlands acquiesced to Spanish rule in what proved to be one of the most decisive conquests recorded. There was not to be a single serious rebellion against the Spanish within the old Mexica Empire for three centuries. Folk, for 300 years, for 300 years, Roman Catholicism strangled the country of Mexico. Page 204 of Fehrenbach's book, Fire and Blood, History of Mexico. Page 204, it says, The work of the sword was followed immediately by the labors of the friars. In a direct continuation of the dreams of Cortez, the missionary effort in Spanish America, Mexico, was the one thing that kept the lordship of Spain from becoming just another ephemeral imperial venture. Spain's free hand in the New World gave governors, bishops, and missionaries a chance to change America forever. To make America Catholic. This era coincided with the greatest flowering of Hispanic civilization, the time of Spanish hope and power and glory, from the reigns of the Catholic kings to the abdication of Charles of Ghent. The priests and teaching brothers planted two roots of culture, language and religion, imperishably in the native populations. Thus they changed the very environment forever in the new world. The efforts of the mission system were a failure, must be described as a failure, but only in the sense of the system's self-imposed goals of making fully Europeanized, fully equal subjects of the Amerindians. Indians. This did not happen for a host of reasons, some historic and some human. But the work of the missionary, missionaries was to prove more effective in the long run than the work of soldiers, merchants, or conquistadors. Why? Why? Is Mexico what Mexico is? Why has it been so poor? Why are the people there with nothing as far as material things? Because the Catholic Church in any country in which they have gone in and they're 
generals have been successful, there is always a two-party system. There are the extremely wealthy and there are the very, very poor. And we see that played out in the history of Mexico. Page 257 of Farron Baugh's book, 257 and 258, he says this, the religious orders entered into the hacienda system. The Jesuits who arrived late in Mexico, from what I have been able to, dedu to deduce, the Franciscans and Dominicans came in in the 1520s. The Jesuit order was not created till the 1540s. The first Jesuit missionaries were in Mexico in the 1560s. As the ink was drying on the final agreements made at the Council of Trent in 1563, there were already Jesuit min, uh, missionaries heading over to Mexico. The Jesuits who arrived late in Mexico bought lands and seemed to have been especially efficient in management. However, the older orders with their original mission largely completed became sterile. The orders and the secular church which entered Mexico in the 17th century, collecting the Indio ties, rapidly became wealthy. In a pious, death-conscious, superstitious Mexico, all branches of the church were deluged with gifts and bequests. This was an old evil in the Mediterranean church. Now in Mexico, the immortal institution's wealth could not be alienated or taxed. And soon it became the largest landowner and landlord in New Spain. This was extremely unhealthy for both the economy and the church itself. Did you hear what that said? The Catholic church in a very, very short amount of time, became the wealthiest and the most powerful landlord in all of Mexico. Church property was not well managed on the whole and clerics presiding over ever-growing wealth became tinged with avarice. That means greed. The church, which itself had done so much to destroy the banking ethos in Spain, now let plentiful money at extremely low rates and required principal to be repaid only at the debtor's death. In the profligate Criollo society, this policy produced more wealth for the church. By the 1630s, as Thomas Gage saw and recorded, the missionary orders had largely turned from serving and protecting the Indios, which are the local population, to living extravagantly off them. The Franciscans, Dominicans, Augustinians, Carmelites, and Jesuits had erected 400 convents by 1600. In 80 years, they had erected 400 convents. That's five a year for 80 years. Uh, let's see. These no longer served any real social or economic purpose, but they had to be supported by native sweat. Many of the friars had become pervasively lazy and corrupt. They spent nights drinking and gambling with cards and dice, finding various legalistic pretexts to evade their vows. Felipe IV, in effect, secularized the Mexican church by turning over the collection of Indio ties. Every subject paid 10% of his income into the church. That was required by law. If the Indios had no money, they paid with portions of their crops or goats or chickens to the secular clergy. The established orders, however, remained ensconced in Mexico, very jealous of each other and of their privileges. Despite the fact that the church as a body was rich and that it collected tithes and retained eight-ninths of these, one-ninth going to the crown. In Mexico, high fees were demanded for every service. The clergy refused to perform marriages, baptisms, or burials except at exorbitant 
cost. In other words, the people of Mexico were raped by the Catholic Church. Page 288, and it still is going on today. Page 288, fire and blood. The church had lost all sense of mission. Its dominant mood was blackness portrayed over every altar by stark images of bleeding Christs and tortured saints. Thousands upon thousands of hooded penitents marched through the streets of Mexico on holy days. Flagellants beat themselves until the blood ran. The missions had failed. But idle friars walked the palaces with their whores and seduced virgins through the confessional. Spanish Catholicism had lost all ethic, retreated into ritual and mysticism. Whores wore crucifixes, and murderous bandits carried images of the Virgin around their necks. Nothing was demanded of the Christian except observance, but that ferociously. Nothing was unpardonable but free thought or heresy. That went on, folks, from 1521 to the early 1800s. For nearly three centuries, the Mexican people were ground down to dust. And they were slaves to the powerful Spanish leaders and the Catholic Church. I want you to understand the time frame here, and we're not going to, we're going to have to have a part two on this next month. When you go from 1521 to almost 300 years later, you're going to come down to about 1800. Now I want you to think in your minds for a moment, what was going on right around 1800? What was going on? Think about it. There were two revolutions that had been fought within about a span of 25 years before 1800. Where was one of those revolutions fought? One was fought in Europe in a country called what? France. And another revolution had been fought in another place called what? was called, okay, the United States or, okay, North America. The ideas of these two revolutions began to go around the world. Now you remember in 1814, a congress was held in Vienna, Austria, and it was held there by the leaders of Europe, Pope Pius VII, and the Jesuit order. And they met there in Vienna in 1814, and their one great concern was this. There are ideas in our world today that people are establishing where human beings have rights, and where governments have to be representative, and where the church and the state are separate. And you know what? Those monarchs of Europe and the Pope were scared to death. Because if those principles would win out, do you know what would happen to those people's thrones? They would be destroyed. And so at the Congress of Vienna in 1814, these monarchs said, we are going to destroy the principles of republicanism and Protestantism. Well, on page 308 of Ferenbaugh's book, Fire and Blood, History of Mexico, he says this, the pamphlets issued from these upheavals, he's talking about the French Revolution and the American Revolution, circulated quite freely despite the opposition of the church. 
the North American Declaration of Independence and the United States Constitution were on the Inquisition's index of forbidden tracks. Did you know that? The United States Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, those two documents were forbidden reading by the Catholic Inquisition. They forbade people to read those because they thought if people read those Protestant documents, they would become tinged with heresy. So they were forbidden tracts. Along with the writings of the French philo philosophers, but most educated people had seen them. In closing, folk, this aspect, and we'll pick up next month on part two of Mexican history. The Mexican people had a decision to make. They'd been controlled by the Spanish and the Catholic Church for three centuries. What would they do? There would be revolution because it was in the air and there was revolution in Mexico throughout the 19th century. There was revolution. But which one would they accept? Would they embrace the principles of the French Revolution or would they embrace the principles of the American Revolution? And folk, there's a big, big difference. And next month in Behind the Door Part 30, We'll take a look at that. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, as we view what our southern neighbors have gone through for centuries, it makes us sad to see a group of people so brutalized for so long, enslaved for so long. Father, I pray that you would burn a desire in each of our hearts to do all we can to help our southern neighbors to know and to learn the truth about Jesus Christ and about his saving grace and his desire to save them from their sins. Please help us to stand in defense of truth and righteousness. In Jesus' name, amen.